Good evening and welcome students, family, friends, and our Alpha Omega Alpha and Gold Humanism Honor Society alumni members. Thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate our students who demonstrate qualities of excellence within our community. We are grateful you are able to join us virtually as we induct our newest members of the Gold Humanism and Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Societies and celebrate their remarkable achievements. To begin our celebration, Dr. Richard Page, 18th Dean of the Learner College of Medicine and Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society member would like to offer his words of congratulations. Thank you so much, Dean Zayla. Greetings to everyone in attendance today and especially the honorees from the class of 2021. I wish we could be joining together in person today, but as we've learned over the past few months, there are still ways we can meaningfully connect as we share significant moments during the pandemic. Earlier this month, I had the pleasure along with Dean Zala to take part in the white coat ceremony for our new first year students. It was more than a bit different from the white coat ceremony experienced by our honorees today, but I could see on the faces of those first year students the excitement that I'm sure you all had when you cross that important milestone for your clinical education. So now three years later, we're here to acknowledge your accomplishments as you join the esteemed ranks of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society and the Gold Humanism Honor Society. You still have clinical rotations and residency interviews to complete, and we'll join together again in some manner in a little over five months for the excitement of match day. Then in May, we'll graduate together and you'll begin your medical careers. So it's appropriate before this last busy sequence of your education for us to take time to recognize those who have achieved so much as members of the Larner College of Medicine class of 2021. The AOA Honor Society goes back to its founding in 1902 and the Larner chapter of AOA was established in 1953. Today, it's one of 132 chapters nationwide at US medical schools recognizing educational achievement and encouraging the development of leaders in academia and their communities. The Gold Humanism Honor Society was founded just in 2002 and has of course been fostered by the same foundation that was key in establishing the white coat ceremony tradition among US medical schools. Keeping humanism front and center in medicine is the mission of the Gold Foundation and it fits, fits seamlessly into the Larner mission. Our guiding statement on professionalism recognizes how we as medical professionals rely on cultural humility, kindness and respect to guide our daily interactions. We all strive to model this behavior, and you who will be inducted into this society today are being recognized for demonstrating those words already in your daily life. So congratulations to our honorees. In the last three years, you've established yourselves as among the finest of a very fine class of 2021. We are all very proud of you. Good luck and best wishes for the next few busy and exciting months. Let me turn things back now to Dean Zayla. Thank you, Dean Page, for those thoughtful remarks. It is now my pleasure to introduce a very special member of our alumni family, Dr. James Swang, Larner College of Medicine, class of 2009. Following graduation, Dr. Huang completed a family medicine residency and chief residency at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York. Today, he is a family medicine physician with Unity Healthcare, a federally qualified health center in Washington, DC, where Dr. Huang provides primary care while tackling pressing community needs and mentoring medical students at all levels of their training. The son of immigrant deaf parents, he witnessed the barriers to health which motivated him to address health equities, inequities. In 2016, he founded CODA, the Comprehensive Medical Care for Deaf Adults and Children Clinic. The 50 staff members provide culturally appropriate care while a partnership with Gallaudet University, the nation's first university designed to be barrier-free for deaf students, expands the clinic's reach. 
Dr. Huang is also working to increase access to healthy food through a produce prescription program for immigrant families. In 2018, he was named an Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity through the George Washington University Workforce Institute. Today, he's a leader in a global network focused on eradicating health disparities. It is a pleasure to have Dr. Huang joining us from Washington, D.C. this evening, not only for me to have an opportunity to reconnect with him, a former medical student leadership group now known as Professionalism, Communication, and Reflection, or PCR student of mine, but for all of us to be inspired by him to be leaders within our communities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Huang. Hi, thank you, Dean Zale, for that introduction. Good evening, Dean Page, Dean Zale, Dr. Green, and Dr. Sandoval, and good evening, class of 2021. I apologize if there's any background, there's um, some fire <laughs> trucks going on around the background. Uh, I'm honored to be invited to join your graduation, uh, your ceremony virtually. All of you have been chosen to be part of the Alpha, Omega, Alpha, and Gold Humanism Honor Societies because you have demonstrated a profound depth of caring and compassion that your colleagues and mentors have witnessed in your care of patients. We all have had diff different life experiences that have guided us to the field of medicine, which will continue to fuel us as we follow our career trajectory. Part of that fuel that drives you will also come from your patients. How you listen to your patients will shape your learning and more importantly, what you do with that knowledge will, import, it will impact your patients' lives and even future generations' lives. As a family medicine doctor and a member of GHHS, the education I receive from my patients is invaluable. I learn from my patients on a daily basis, whether it's working with individuals who are experiencing homelessness, learning about the living conditions at certain shelters, and inability to store insulin so we can change so we change medication regimens to control their hemoglobin a1c's or learning about issues with access to fresh fruits and vegetables from families who have screened positive for food insecurity which as dr zale mentioned that led me to prescribe fruits and vegetables in family nutrition cl uh, class group visits learning about the various factors that impact my patients lives has pushed me to not only make sure their immediate health needs are met but also drives me to work towards health equity. There are many definitions of health equity. I'll share Dr. Kamara Jones's definition, which is the assurance of the condition of optimal health for all people. I'll say it again, and please take a moment to reflect on those words. The assurance of the condition of optimal health for all people. As medical professionals, we are called to ensure all people have optimal health, but how can we create the assurance of the condition? How we listen and what we can do with the knowledge we learn will move our society towards health equity. This year, the US celebrates the 30th anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act, otherwise known as the ADA, legislation that protects the rights of people with disabilities and at least in the disability world, movement towards health equity. Even before the ADA, there were multiple conditions that elevated my, pa patient, my parents' health. As Dr. Dale mentioned, both of my parents are deaf and immigrants. Uh, my mom uh, became multilingual, already knowing Chinese and Chinese sign language. She learned English and American sign language through her local program and enrolled in job training classes. My dad was able to attend and graduate from Gallaudet University, which is here in DC. And at the time, the only university for the deaf in the world without a high school degree. These conditions helped our family towards optimal health. However, there were also conditions that repressed our health. Before the ADA, my parents didn't have a right to ASL interpreters at any of our medical visits. Information would be lost. Writing back and forth is not ideal as literacy levels vary within the deaf community. And we have to remember that people who are deaf, their primary language is American Sign Language. So like other non-English speaking patients, it would be unfair to ask them to write, read and write in English. At one medical visit, my father who had abdominal pain was given an antacid and never returned to that doctor. So what we would class classify as lost to follow up. But perhaps he didn't follow up because there was no interpreter at the visit and he didn't understand what was said. 
Several months later, I came home after school one day and we found a note that he had gone to the hospital with excruciating abdominal pain. He was eventually diagnosed with metastatic gastric cancer. Learning from him, my mom, and my other deaf patients, I know that issues with communication is one of the causes of health disparities within the deaf community. People who are deaf experience higher rates of cardiovascular disease, higher incidence of mental health illnesses, and have less preventative care. This knowledge led me to start the CODA clinic. Within deaf culture, CODA means child of deaf adults. And I wanted to recognize my upbringing with naming my clinic CODA, which here in DC means comprehensive medical care for deaf adults and children. CODA clinic patients have seen better rates of cancer screenings, vaccination rates, and A1Cs in patients with diabetes. I see the CODA clinic as a tool to assure the conditions of optimal health for the deaf community by not only providing healthcare in uh, people's primary language, but also to educate staff and the larger community about how to improve healthcare for the deaf. We've had a series of ASL classes for staff with plans to do more. I've also had the opportunity to share my work at national conferences and lecture medical students and re uh, residents on working with the deaf community. Lastly, by having more deaf healthcare professionals, we can support health equity. The CODA clinic has been a place for students who are deaf to shadow me. The students that I've worked with have had difficulty finding shadowing experiences due to fear from clinical preceptors around communication or possibly having to hire an ASL interpreter. The ADA has been in place for 30 years and because the rights to equity have been protected, more and more students with disabilities have had the opportunity to pursue health professional education. There are already several deaf doctors around the country and we can train more. These doctors are educating their colleagues and staff on what it means to be deaf and break down biases and stereotypes of deaf people. We know that health care providers who come from the same communities they are serving will have better patient relationships and outcomes. Imagine a world where my mom can go to a primary care visit where everyone from the front desk to the nurse and her PCP can sign with her. Last year, my brother-in-law and my sister were telling me a story about a cookout last summer and they were grilling burgers and one and gave one to my mom who started to bite into it and immediately uh, after doing that went inside and she started microwaving it. My sister chased her down and asked her why she was doing that and my mom replied that it was still pink in the middle and that my doctor told me to eat less red meat so that's why I cooked it more. My sister told her what the doctor really meant was that she should eat less beef. We all had a good laugh over this but in telling the story makes me reflect and how much is lost in translation. And I wonder how empowered are our patients to share their voices in their care. The current pandemic highlights how patient voices are lost and the deaf community is no different. Hard of hearing and deaf people have increased challenges to communication because of masks. Reading lips is not a main means of communication, but can definitely assist in visual communication, which is now hindered behind cloth masks, which also hide facial expressions. Clinic and hospital policies have impacted the number of guests allowed, meaning that ASL interpreters may face barriers in accompanying patients to medical visits or interpret for them in the emergency room. These policies were made to decrease the spread of COVID-19, but have had unintended consequences of barriers to communication, especially for the deaf community. I wonder who was present when these decisions were made and who was not present. You are here because you've been recognized for your listening skills. And now the challenge in our quest for health equity is to listen for the voices we don't hear and reflect on how their voices can be included in the assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. As members of the AOA and the and GHHS, we are called to listen and learn from our patients and use that knowledge to work with our communities to push for health equity. Congratulations on being inducted into the AOA and GHHS. I look forward to see what you have to do in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Huang, for your words of inspiration and especially for serving as an advocate for health equity within your community. Although this year's ceremony is quite different from how we traditionally have celebrated important milestones of our students, we have come to appreciate virtual celebration opportunities. To engage our audience tonight, 
we encourage you to submit messages of support and congratulations to our inductees using go.uvm.edu slash G-H-H-S-A-O-A dash submit and view a live feed of the messages at a similar link. Now I would like to introduce our Learner College of Medicine Alpha Omega Alpha Society faculty counselor, Dr. Marie Sandoval, associate professor in the Department of Medicine and Alpha Omega Alpha member since 1995 to present and formally induct our newest members of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. Dr. Sandoval. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a general internist and I'm also currently the medical director at my outpatient clinic. And I've been practicing for 22 years and anyone who has ever worked with me knows that I absolutely adore my patients, especially my elder patients. And I actually have two patients who are over hundred years old. The years have flown by and I have had the pleasure of being the LCOM Alpha Omega Alpha counselor for almost two years. Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society was established in 1902, as Dr. Page just said, by actually a group of medical students at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Chicago. And it was actually started to advance the expectations of training from a former trade level education. As Dr. Page said, it has grown to actually, he quoted 132 national chapters over the last approximately 120 years and have some highlighted notable AOA members listed here on this slide. Election to Alpha Omega Alpha is an honor that signifies a lasting commitment to the key tenets of the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Society, which are professionalism, scholarship, leadership, and service. Alpha Omega Alpha is dedicated to the belief that in the profession of medicine, we will improve care for all by recognizing high educational achievement, honoring gifted teaching, encouraging the development of leaders in ac the academic and community, and supporting the ideals of humanism, and of course, promoting service to others. It is a lifelong honor and membership in the society confers recognition for a physician's dedication to the profession and art of healing. We are also recognizing faculty and residents who were elected by our AOA cohort tonight, and they're, um, they're uh, showing us the tenets of the AOA Honor Society. The Larner College of Medicine AOA students were selected through the display detail process here listed on the slide based on initial academic achievement of being in the top 25% of the class, an application submission, and then selection of the top 16% of our local um, LCOM AOA selection committee, or excuse me, by our local LCOM AOA selection committee. AOA also has numerous services and programs and opportunities to our medical community that are listed on this slide. It is my great honor to present to you our AOA 2020 cohort. Our cohort includes members of the Larner College of 2021. It also includes two incredible residents and a faculty member who were selected by our Larner College of Medicine 2020 AOA inductees for induction earlier this year. I invite each inductee to have a moment in the spotlight, share a brief hello and be courted for their formal induction into AOA. Now to present our members of the Larner College of Medicine 2021 who are identified as the top 16% of their class as representatives of all the tenants of AOA and selected for induction into the national chapter. Note, some of the names will not be called in alphabetical order, some will be called as a household. First, Catherine Callahan. Hi there. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to my mom, my dad, and my sister. I love you guys and wouldn't be here without you. Next, Michael Shimleski. Next, Annabelle Davey. And Olivia Harrison. <laughs> 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 
Next, Jack Dubuque. Kaylee Bielin. Sydney Hilker. Fawn Hong. Oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth Lanata. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Next, Von Hahn. Alexander Karbetchev. Catherine Kernicha. I'd love to thank my family, my friends, and my partner for helping me get uh, where I am today. Olivia Larkin. Joy Lowry. Uh, I just wanted to thank my husband and family and friends for helping me get to where I am. <laughs> Michael Weber. Um, hi, everybody. I uh, want to give a shout out to my mother who's watching and actually just figured out how to use Zoom prior to this, <laughs> um, and my partner who's also watching. Sean Marr. Katrina Thornburg. The following students were unable to join us this evening. However, we will still honor, induct, and celebrate them today. Raga Goyal and Max Silverstein. Now for our faculty and resident AOA inductees, the Lerner College of 2020 selected these faculty and staff for embracing the key tenets of the AOA Medical Society. They serve as exemplars of the AOA values in their daily work with patients and students. Dr. Stas Amato from the Department of Surgery was one of two residents to receive the 2020 OA House Staff Award this past spring. I do not believe he is on. I'm here. Ah, or she, I'm so sorry. No worries. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, it's an honor and humbling to serve as a clinical instructor and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work with and teach medical students. Uh, I probably learn more from the students than they do from me. And for that, um, I want to say thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Jay Steele from Neurology. Dr. Steele was our second recipient of the 2020 AOA House Staff Award this past spring and is being courted by... Uh, hi, everyone. This is my daughter, Fiona, uh, performing the, the courting. And uh, it's been a great honor. I uh, appreciate the class of 2020 for this distinction. Uh, a lot of great experience working in, with them on the neurology awards and uh, hope to see uh, many more medical students coming through in the years ahead. Thank you. I would also like to recognize Dr. Shadden Eldekar Hine from Internal Medicine, Hospital Medicine, who was unable to join us this evening. She received the 2020 AOA Faculty Award this past spring. Thank you so much to our newest faculty and resident members for your ongoing commitment and service to our students and communities. It is my great honor to officially welcome you to the National AOA Chapter on behalf of the Lerner College of Medicine. And as a reminder, you can continue to submit messages to our, to our inductees via these two sites. Now I would like to invite Dr. Andrea Green, Professor of Pediatrics and Gold Humanism Honor Society Faculty Advisor to formally honor our 2020 Gold Humanism Honor Society inductees. Hi everyone, um, good evening. My name is Dr. Andrea Green. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Lerner College of Medicine and I serve as the medical director of the Pediatric New American Clinic. Um, my practice and scholarship is in the care of children and immigrant families. 
I'm really happy to be here with all of you to celebrate this year's Gold Humanism Honor Society inductees. We're gonna show you some slides now. Great. So Dr. Arnold Gold was a pediatric neurologist whose belief in the importance of an empathetic bedside manner led him and his wife to create a foundation in 1988 to inspire young doctors to practice compassionate patient care. The Gold Foundation engages schools, healthcare systems, companies, and individual clinicians in the joy and meaning of humanistic medicine so that patients and their families can be partners in collaborative, compassionate, and scientifically excellent care. In 1993, the foundation started white coat ceremonies at medical schools in which students pledge the Hippocratic Oath in the early days of their education rather than at graduation as is common practice. Dr. Gold felt that graduation was too late to set the expectations for the clinicians they would become. And all of you know this because you've participated in it. In 2002, the Gold Foundation created the Honor Society to recognize medical students, residents, and faculty members who are exemplars of compassionate patient care and who serve as role models, mentors, and leaders in medicine. Tonight, our GHHS inductees are joining a community of champions of humanisms with more than 35,000 members. The Lerner College of Medicine is one of 168 plus chapters around the world and demonstrates the college commitment to humanism and medicine. The college ho chapter hosts many events to champion humanism and this inductee class is currently implementing a program at the University of Vermont Medical Center called Tell Me More. This new program allows patients to share a fuller picture of who they are beyond their diagnosis and job description. And I'm very proud of them about this. We're now gonna just watch a brief clip about GHHS. The Gold Humanism Honor Society was created to recognize exemplars of the kind of doctoring that we all want for ourselves. You wear a pretty dress. Where did you get this dress? What the Gold Humanism Honor Society does, it recognizes excellent students and faculty that have those characteristics of humanism. Why? Because we want every single student to realize that's a goal that you must try to achieve. Good to see you this morning. It makes a stand and says, this is an important part of our medical curriculum. You have to listen to and learn from your patients. I have been a member of the Gold Humanism Honor Society for a year now and was elected by my classmates, which I think was probably the greatest honor of medical school. After becoming a member of the Gold Humanism Honor Society, I became exposed to mentors and national leaders in medicine that make humanistic medicine a frontline treatment in patient care. It's not just one day I got this award and that's it, and I'll just look back on it and say thanks, but it's a constant reminder for the future well, it's nice to talk with you. of how I want to be as a physician. Okay, I understand. I understand. The society serves as a model of what we're striving for that you want to be the very best doctor you can be, and at the same time, have this humanistic approach to interacting with patients. That's what the Honor Society is about. Our medical students were peer nominated and they are the individuals that their classmates say they would want to care for their own family. We also have one faculty member who was selected for induction into GHHS this past spring. After our GHHS inductees enjoy their individual spotlight, I will lead you in reading the Gold Humanism Honor Society oath together. The oath was sent in your certificate holder and we don't expect you to have it memorized just yet. Um, now I'm pleased to present to you the members of the class of 2021, nominated by their class 
selected by the current GHHS members of the Vermont chapter as exemplars of GHHS principles. I'm honored to induct them into GHHS this evening. Note that some of the names will not be called in alphabetical order as some people are sharing in the same household, just like you saw before. So first is Mina Awadala. You're muted. Yeah. So thank you for our family watching at home. Yay. Oh, that's okay. You can go first. So then we have Andrea Bose. You want to say anything? Thank you to my family as well. Michael Shumaleski. Jenna Dapchek. You're muted. Oh gosh, sorry. Thanks to my family at home, especially my parents. <laughs> Christina Dawson. I just want to say thank you so much to my family and I'm so honored. Happy to be here. Sam Epstein. Kaylee Field. Nicholas Haslett. <laughs> we got it. Thank you so much, everybody. I can't believe it's quiet here. We're looking for Alexander Karpachuk. There you are. <laughs> oh, and and Hona Shodan. Hana, sorry. And thank you to my family and everyone that's watching. I love you a lot. And thank you to Hana. Oh, yeah. Thanks to my family too, especially my baby nephew <laughs> and Alex. <laughs> Dylan. Kundichin. Just want to say uh, thanks also to my family. Uh, happy birthday, Bruce. See you tomorrow. And um, and yeah, congratulations, everybody. Olivia Larkin. I just um, wanted to say thank you to Jeff, my family, and the Hodens, my second family. Joy Lowry. And Michael Weber. Thank, Thank you. you. Sienna Searles. <laughs> um, just want to say thank you to my parents who are watching and my partner here. Shivani Seth. And Stephanie Udawala. Just want to say hello, hello and thank you to my parents and my Elcom family. We would also like to honor one additional student, Mary McDonald Griffin, this evening. Mary is a class of 2021 member of GHHS, but she was inducted in the fall of 2019. And now I'd like to honor our faculty GHHS inductee, Dr. Anna Kutros from the Department of Family Medicine was selected as, as the Lerner College of Medicine 2020 Leonard Tao Humanism and Medicine Faculty Award recipient earlier this spring. Dr. Kutros was unable to join us this evening, but we congratulate her on her induction. Now I invite you all GHHS members to recite the oath. I will begin by reading the first line of the oath and then your GHHS chapter president, Andrea Bose and vice president, Michael Chmielowski will read the oath 
inductees are asked to recite the oath with them at home. So if everybody finds their piece of paper, we'll get started. All right, we ready? I pledge by all that I hold dear as a physician. I will listen to my patients with, or sorry, I will care for my patients with compassion, respect, empathy, integrity, and clinical excellence. I will listen to my patients with my whole being. I will advocate for each patient as a unique individual. I will serve as a role model and mentor to promote humanism in healthcare. I will remember always the healing power of acts of caring. I will dedicate myself to joining with others to make healthcare optimal for all. It is my great honor to present our 20, I think 21, it's written 2020, um, GHHS inductees. Congratulations to you all. So just another reminder to submit messages um, to this evening's inductees who are able to watch your messages roll in live this evening. So medicine is both an art and a science. A patient tells their story and the physician records the themes, investigates the nuances, suggests edits, and bends the plot. Sometimes the telling of the story is healing in and of itself. Story Slam RX is a project of the Gold Humanism Honor Society and AOA that brings together members of the Lerner College of Medicine and the UVM Medical Center to share a five minute personal true story with a beginning, middle and an end based on a prompt. It allows members of the healthcare workforce to become the storyteller to narrate their own experience of resilience or of being lost and found. The event creates community, allows reflection, and builds strength through vulnerability. In the fast pace of scientific advancement, it brings an artful dose of medicine to the caregiver. This year's Story Slam RX will be held virtually on the evening of January 21st. Suzanne Schmidt, the producer of The Moth here in Vermont, will host a free workshop on December 3rd where interested Lerner College and UVMMC staff can create or hone their story. So stay tuned for this year's theme. Honoring the overlap of our two honor societies and what we share, exemplifying service to our community, we wanted to share one of our most treasured stories from a past Story Slam event. Dr. Isabel de Hardin has been serving as our Chief Medical Officer at the University of Vermont Medical Center since October of 2017. She was the first woman and first psychiatrist to serve as our CMO at the UVM Medical Center. Since August of 2003, she has worked as an attending physician in the UVM Department of Psychiatry. She was promoted to Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Lauren College of Medicine in 2008 and has served in numerous physician leadership functions throughout her career. She also serves as founding partner of Wiser Systems Inc Incorporated an information technology software company. Dr. Dehardin received her doctorate of medicine and completed her internship at the University de Montreal, Canada. She subsequently completed her residency training in psychiatry and fellowship in geriatric psychiatry at Emory University in Atlanta. Her deeply personal story that she shared during our first uh, Larner College of Medicine Society Honor Society Story Slam touched me to my core. Since January of 2019, it's been a beacon for me through the following soul crushing situations such as our recent COVID crisis, social justice crisis, financial crisis, political crisis, and now our current health crisis in regards to our um, computer system. I'm thrilled that she agreed to share her story with us, again, as part of our Honor Society induction. And with deep gratitude, I give you Dr. DeHardin and her story. I'm Dr. Isabel Desjardins, and I was asked to um, tell a story that I've already told before. Four. 
And I was a little hesitant about telling the story yet again. But I realized that stories are meant to be told and they can be very powerful. And I sure hope that you find your own stories to tell in the future and one day you can be in my shoes. So I'm gonna bring you back to more than 10 years ago when I was the medical director on the inpatient psychiatry unit here at UVM Medical Center. And at that time, um, we had the unfortunate uh, event of having one of our patients who died by suicide on the unit. That was a very difficult period and uh, I felt very responsible for what happened. I felt a sense of accountability since it was under my watch. And we were all trying to cope different ways. That um, event triggered a lot of um, questioning as to how we were doing things. And during the month that followed, we had a series of different patients who tried to hurt themselves on the unit. And that was really scary. I was scared. So trying to cope, I frantically reviewed all the literature on inpatient suicides, trying to regain some sense of control over my own capacities and sense of um, professional competency, if you will, and try to understand the drivers and what can, what can be done and what we were missing because we had one person who had died by suicide and then multiple different people trying to hurt themselves. I came across a paper that summarized what patients expressed they really wanted and what they really needed. And that paper really stuck with me. And the, the, the foundation of the need was so powerful, yet very difficult to operationalize. And what was described as what the patients needed was hope and the absence of shame. I did reflect on that and I'm still reflecting on that uh, since then. Um, asking myself how, how to do that? How can this be translated to a busy clinical setting? I really scratched my head and I never really figured it out. So approximately a year after I read that paper, I decided to just keep telling my team that that's what we do, that we instill hope and we minimize shame. And maybe collectively we'll figure it out. We maybe collectively we'll figure out how to do that because that's certainly not something that I learned in medical school and residency training. And um, hoping that people would, people on my team, people on the unit would kind of pause and think about and push themselves to think about how do we do that. So that happened like 10 years ago. And then I'm going to bring you forwarding a little bit later, two or three years after that. So during that time, I keep telling people, this is what we do. We instill hope and minimize shame. That's the essence. So a couple of years later, I'm taking care of a patient on the inpatient unit. It's a Friday, late morning, and I've been working 12 days in a row. It's a Friday after a whole long weekend that I was on call. And I go see my patients and I have a patient who um, had been in the, in the hospital for a number of days and every day um, it was the same conversation. My patient was a very bright person in their late 30s, having symptoms of trauma that they had not really overcome or transcended from. 
and they were experiencing ongoing suicidal thoughts, ongoing urge to die and to kill themselves and end their lives. And it seems that it seemed as if none of the tools that I had in my toolkit were working or impacting or changing or or modifying the response or the quality of the interaction that I had with my patient. And that day, I was tired. I was not very patient. I was tired. So there I, I come and talk to my patient that morning. And it's the same conversation and the same topic. And then something happened that I couldn't spend another hour talking about the same thing with the patient. I just had didn't have it in me. So I spontaneously told the patient, you know what? I know you don't believe that, but I know that you will get better. I know you will get better. I don't know when you're going to get better, but I know you will. And you know, I understand that you don't have, and you can't even imagine that. I understand that you don't have that hope, that you don't even see it. Well, I'm going to be holding on to that hope for you. And when you're ready to take the hope back, you let me know. And I left. I left the room. It was the shortest meeting I've ever had with a patient. <laughs> and they really came from me being exhausted and being at my limit and somehow not knowing what to do for this patient and really not knowing what to say anymore, that everything was exhausted in terms of my toolkit. And I just told her what I really thought in that moment. I felt a little bad that I had shortened the time that I, I was not as patient because I had that level of awareness. Yet I knew that what I said really came from a good place. Then I bring you fast forward another couple of years. It was a busy day. One of those days where you start the day, you have your day all set up and you hope that nothing is going to throw your schedule off because you really know that you have to perform as scheduled. And on that day, I knew I had to show up at the school of my kids for some type of presentation or something, or pick them up. For sure, something with my kids that I was under pressure for, which was customary in those days. So I, re I receive a page asking me to come and see this patient on the unit. And that day I, I didn't have um, responsibility for the inpatient unit. So there was a curveball in my day. And I was stressed. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? This patient wants to see me. I'm going to go on the unit. It's going to take at least an hour. Um, my colleagues are going to think that I'm getting into their space because I'm not responsible for the patient, but the patient is asking to see me. Complicated. So with a little bit of a dread, Given all the pressures, I go see the patient. 
I get on the unit, I go see the patient, clear everything from my mind, and the patient is in a group room, a group is finishing, I come in, I say hello, and it's as, as if time had stopped. The, patient's lo the patient looks at me straight in the eyes and the only thing she said is, I'm ready to take the hope back. I was moved. I'm still moved. I'm still moved because it's changed me as much as it changed the patient. Being a doctor is about holding so much knowledge. It's about trying to find the right answer all the time. And the irony is that I kind of found a healer in me when I reached the limit of my own knowledge. I sure hope that you find that limit for yourself. And that most importantly, you enjoy the journey. I hope that you can tell stories the same kinds of stories that I'm telling today. Because we need you. And we're very proud of you. And we know that you can make the difference. Thank you for your dedication. And thank you for being you. What an inspiring story by Dr. Desjardins and what a wonderful ceremony. Thank you all for joining us this evening to honor our medical students. This evening would not have been possible without the dedicated efforts of a number of individuals, specifically Dean Page, Dr. Sandoval and Dr. Green, Kirsten Halquist, our student service coordinator, Liz Dorman, our events manager, and our audiovisual experts, Bruce Kimball and Jason Towsley. Finally, I want to say congratulations again to all of our students. Being in medical school is challenging enough, and yet you have all found additional time and energy to engage in leadership, service, research, and advocacy for the benefit of others. We wish you all the best in your future medical residency program and throughout your career. If you don't have your cameras on, please turn on your cameras at this time so that we and our participating audience may acknowledge your many accomplishments one last time before we conclude our ceremony this evening. Congratulations. And thank you also to our keynote speaker, Dr. Huang. Thank you, Dr. Huang. That concludes our ceremony. Thank you so much.